number. Even the president of the commission, the current president, Ursula von der Leyen, and her predecessor, Jean-Claude Juncker, have both made statements, not only that the European Union itself was built out of the ashes of World War II, but that when we talk about the ashes of World War II, we're also talking about the ashes of the Holocaust. And von der Leyen has made that statement time and time again in public speeches. And since the European Union is founded on democratic ideals, this is an issue, a concern. We talk about anti-Semitism that erodes trust in the European Union as well. There's a great quote by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs who addressed the European Parliament in 2016. And he said, we make a great mistake if we think anti-Semitism is a threat only to Jews. It is a threat first and foremost to Europe and to the freedoms it took centuries to achieve. So one of the things, if we look at the rise of anti-Semitism, and I know we're all in this October 7, post-October 7th moment, but if you actually look at the data, anti-Semitism has been on the rise in Europe really since 2001. And um, part of that, you know, why 2001? There's a couple of reasons for it. We can come back to these during question and answer. One of them has to do with the United Nations World Conference Against Racism in Durban, which began to spread the notion of Zionism as racism. Um, and the other event that's going to add to anti-Semitism in Europe is actually 9-11. And some of you may be familiar with some of the conspiracy theories that emerged after 9-11. There was a book that became very popular that was published in Europe that um, basically the premise was that Jews had committed 9-11 and that Jews um, basically, you know, all the Jews got together and said, you know, leave the towers when, when the planes come. Um, and this conspiracy was spread throughout Europe. And you'll see little by little that the numbers of anti-Semitic um, events are going to increase from that point. And part of the reason why we know this, that we have this data, is that there was a study done by the European Union Monitoring Center for Racism and Xenophobia. It's called, it was called then the EUMC today. It's the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, or what's short for FRA. So it's an EU institution that focuses on all kinds of issues of racism, xenophobia, discrimination. And they had published a report in 2003, and I can talk you, there's a whole long discussion about that report, but the report demonstrated a rise in anti-Semitism across Europe, and that it was being perpetuated both by the far right, the political far right, the political far left, and by Muslim extremists. And if you look at the data across EU member states, the, there has been a constant rise of anti-Semitism in the past 20 years. And just to bring it to more sort of contemporary times, um, COVID, we saw a significant surge in anti-Semitism. And particularly, um, much of that, um, the examples of anti-Semitism were being fostered online on social media platforms. Um, there were conspiracies that Jews had created the coronavirus and that Jews then created the vaccine so that they could make a profit off of the virus, um, which is sort of a, you know, a traditional anti-Semitic trope that um, is often used. Also, there is something called what we call Holocaust trivialization during COVID. And there were protests both in France and Germany and other parts of Europe. People were protesting the COVID lockdowns. And they equated COVID lockdowns to how Jews were treated in the Holocaust. And um, for those of you who, all of us survived COVID, I don't think it was anything like the Holocaust. And so that's a trivialization of the Holocaust, which is considered what, it, what scholars call secondary anti-Semitism. And let's move to where we are today in Europe in post October 7th. Synagogues have been attacked and desecrated following the Hamas attack. 
and Israel. Holocaust memorials, Jewish cemeteries, and homes were vandalized. Violent attacks against Jews have been committed. There have been death threats to prominent Jewish politicians, including the speaker and a member of the National Assembly in France. And just last week, there was a um, prominent member of the Bulgarian parliament that was also um, accosted in the streets. In the weeks following October 7th, and you know, take a look at this data. For example, for Germany, just within a month's time, from October 7th to November 9th, there was a 320% increase of anti-Semitic acts compared to 2022. There were 994 incidences that happened during that month. In France, within, again, the same time frame, approximately a month, five weeks, 1,500 recorded acts of anti-Semitism. There have been 600 arrests during that time period. In the Netherlands, an 800% increase in incidents compared to the year prior. There were 107 anti-Semitic incidents in October of 2023. There were 122 for the entire year of 2022. Austria a 300% increase compared to the year prior. In Italy, 135 incidents of anti-Semitism between October 7th and December 31st. The United Kingdom, now I know we're talking a little bit more about the European Union, but we're talking about Europe as well. In the United Kingdom, we have seen 4,103 anti-Semitic incidents in 2023. It's the highest total reported in a single calendar year. It's an increase of 147% from the year prior. And this comes from the security, the Community Security Trust, which is an organization that monitors anti-Semitism. I want to point out that Europe is not alone. In the United States, we have seen 3,291 incidents of anti-Semitism between October 7th and January 7th. That's a 361% increase compared to the same period last year. According to the United States FBI hate crime statistics, now I only have the stats for 2022 because they just came out in October of 2023. I'll be very curious to see these stats when they come out next October. But just look, 2022, the Anti-Defamation League recorded it before 2023 happened as the highest rate of anti-Semitism that we had seen in the United States. And I'm afraid to see what 2023's data is going to look like. And just take a look at these numbers. These are FBI hate crime statistics. So these are officially recorded hate crimes. There were 2,042 reported incidents across the United States. More than half of these, 1,122, were driven by anti-Jewish bias. Incidents involving anti-Muslims were 158, and anti-Sikh, 181. These are not good numbers for the United States. So unfortunately, I know we're going to focus on Europe today, but Europe is not alone, unfortunately, in the rise of anti-Semitism. So I wanted to give you a little bit of that landscape of where we are right now regarding anti-Semitism. And without further ado, I would like to bring up Professor Robert Gutman to now give us a little bit more of a historic, ethnographic discussion of anti-Semitism, and then we'll return and talk a little bit about policy. Professor Gutman. Hi, uh, my name is Robbie Gutman. I am an economics professor at Hofstra. I've been here since 1984. Uh, I usually give talks about the economy or you know <laughs> whatever, but this is going to be a very different kind of talk because it's a very personal talk. Uh, but I don't want to just like go through my own personal history without contextualizing it. 
uh, because otherwise I'm going to get carried away. Uh, and so I've been thinking about this topic also from the experiences that I've had from the very moment that I was born all the way till today, 72 years later. And, uh, you know, I have put myself into a certain context, right? Uh, and I'm trying to convey that context to you, right? Just briefly, very briefly, right? I was born in a displaced persons camp uh, in post-war Austria uh, to parents that were Hungarian Holocaust survivors. Uh, there, there again, you can see already the incredible difference in the terms of the accident where you're born and where you grow up. My father was born in a small town, would be called a shtetl, uh, near the Ukrainian, Romanian, Hungarian, Slovakian border in a very particular corner of, the, of Eastern Europe. And uh, he, he, uh, he was an uh, orthodox family, uh, mo and most of the family got killed. Uh, he lost his wife, he lost his child, he lost his parents, he lost seven of his siblings, and he himself was for two years in a camp, right, and left dead basically to die and didn't die. And uh, of course, uh, he was kept alive by one of his brothers who also was there and had access to food and medication. And so they didn't bother to kill him. He kind of hung in there. But the day that the Americans came to liberate that camp called Mauthausen in Austria, his, his jubilant brother was eating too much and died that day. And so my father was already marked just by that. He had a survivor's guilt. He tried to kill himself several times. And in one of those moments where I found him and saved him, he started a kind of a war against me and it made me leave. And that's how I ended up here, right? So this is pretty deeply emotional on some levels, right? And I usually don't talk about that at all, right? Because part of, the, part of what's, what's kind of complicated in the story is that when you grow up as a child of Holocaust survivors, surrounded by other children of Holocaust survivors, the question how you talk about this whole experience and how you kind of square together as, as kids the collective madness of your parents as trauma uh, induced uh, behavior that you don't understand is weird, okay? So you, you, you grow up with, with in this kind of framework, right, of hypervigilance and with lo lots of question marks, but your parents cannot really explain what they're doing. At the same time, there's this jubilant post-war moment in that community of survivors, right? And so I grew up actually not, on, I mean, I was a very happy kid in a refugee camp. All my pictures are like, you know, surrounded with other kids, people dancing, whatever, right? So. I mean, it's a strange experience, I can tell you that, right? But I've gone through since then a whole, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm partly in New York, I'm partly also in Paris. I, I worked there for 29 years and I, I, I retired from Paris in 2009. I was the vice director of a, of a famous research lab. And there also I worked with, with mostly Arab and, Arab and students from former French colonies of African uh, descent. And so I was deeply entrenched in you know, Senegalese music and, and a rye dance and so forth, right? So I, I got a very multicultural ex kind of exposure that liberated me out of my, you know, one more step. So I have a long history. I have a long history, right? And now that I'm kind of like trying to figure out how I got to be where I am, you know, and why I'm, why I'm going through this moment in a, in a broader context, I will try to give you some of my thoughts. Right? My first thought is that anti-Semitism, if it rises, it rises pretty explosively uh, because it's always latent there and there are trigger events that make it come up. And when it comes up, it comes up in a pretty complex and and an almost propagating wave, right? And it has been going on for a long time. When I mean, you you have many localities where Jews ended up living, and they have their own history of integration, tension, conflict, expulsion, etc. There's you know you can go anywhere in Europe and study the local history of that place by just looking at the cycles of of, of, of Jewish integration and expulsion, right? But every now and then, every now and then. The, the position of anti-Semitism becomes a much bigger story because it has global implications. It becomes a vector of global instability. And this was true in the 1880s when you have Russian pogroms and there was mass expulsions of Russians out of Russia coming to Central Europe and both destabilizing the situation in Russia as well as in Central Europe. This was also true in the 1930s, of course, with the rise of Nazism and, and, the, and the Holocaust. So you have to understand that a particular, how shall I say, configuration, representational configuration of anti-Semitism is both extremely local and extremely global at the same time. And in that moment, it becomes a vector of instability. 
And we are precisely right now at such a moment, right? Uh, this is a pattern. You have to understand that this is a pattern, right? There's, there's, there's a sort, because basically when humans live in groups and aggregate to societies and then try to develop social contracts, how to coexist, they have to make choices. They're making choices between, on the one hand, competing with each other, but cooperating and respecting each other, or they make choices not to do that and to let co co competition uh, grow into conflict. And the conflict is both local domestic, but it's also geopolitical, okay? You have powers. And every now and then you have shifts in power structure as we have right now. And then, then the, that question of what choice you're making becomes a different choice because you're going from a particular configuration of peace and prosperity to a configuration of crisis and war. Okay? This is a kind of a cyclical history. And it's there. And I've, I've been working about, uh, on that question for a long time. Okay, so this is, this is also my own thinking, right? Uh, about how the economy, how capitalism goes through those long waves, right? But when you have anti-Semitism, it, it touches both of these dimensions because it becomes an engine of local conflict and it also becomes an engine of global shifts in the power structure, in the hierarchy. Okay, and these shifts come about with crisis, pandemics, wars, just as we're going through right now. Right? So we're in a crucial moment. We're in a crucial moment. We're in a kind of a 1937 moment. Right? We just went through a global crisis and it shifted the power structure. It, 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 it kind of messed up domestic politics in lots of places. And we're going towards war. You know, we're going towards war. Typically, when you look at World War configurations, right, uh, and then you can go back to the, I mean, you can go back a long way, but you can go back all the way to the 1750s if you want to have just modern capitalism play a role here, right? You get, you get wars that become regional wars. Regional wars become part of how the global power structure shifts, and then you get kind of a World War configuration, right? And, you know, there's a pattern. There's a pattern. Whether it's the Napoleonic Wars, uh, <laughs> World War I, World War II, and where are we going right now? Right? And so, you know, to me the question is, you know, why the Jews? You know, it's like 15.7 million people, right? It's, just, it's, it's like the population of New York State. And half of them live in, you know, Israel, and half of them, you know, nearly half of them live in the US. And then there's little small groups all over the world, okay? Which I have visited many places, I have to tell you. But anyway, uh, it's an interesting social psychological phenomenon because basically how you relate to Jews from the anti-Semitic point of view of othering a group, okay, is in inherently contradictory. Because on the one hand, the Jews are always very well entrenched in their society, so they're there, they're there to kind of just like same language that Trump uses, dilute the place and, and, and make it impure. Right. But they say, but you know, there's, there, at the one hand, they're the hyper capitalists, and at the same time, they're the revolutionaries that are overthrowing society. At the same time. And you know what? What's weird? I was one of those because I ended up being a Marxist. Once I broke with my Orthodox tradition, I was both a Marxist, and I'll talk to you about that. But I was also working for the Israeli embassy, you know? And that's a key moment in my life. I'll get to that a bit later, okay? So you can actually, you understand, when you live through that, you also understand that what those guys have in their mind has a kernel of truth. That's why it works. It gets decontextualized out of, out of a certain context, and then it gets recontextualized in a different context as prejudice. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? The, 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 confi the, the representations of anti-Semitism, they're, they're not stupid, okay? They're not, they're not like QAnon conspiracies, okay? They're not. They, they have bearing in history. They have grounding in local culture, okay? And they're deeply entrenched. So that's another thing. This is a 2,000-year-long history, okay? So you, you, have a, you have always this picture of the hypercapitalist, and then you have the picture of, of the revolutionary, right? But you also have this conspiracy thing that the Jews are a group all over the world trying to figure out how to dominate the whole place. 
They have like some unbelievable power that I've never ever seen in my own community, okay? But they have a history to get to that point. That's important, okay? And then at the same time, they have another configuration as, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, craftsmen that take away your job. And then also as Christ killers, okay? And, and so you have a religious dimension, you have an economic dimension, you have a global kind of, they're the globalist force dimension. And whenever you have, whenever you have conflict, that period where we're making a choice towards conflict, it's local nationalistic tendencies that come to the fore. They're anti-globalist. They want to have an insular kind of society because they're afraid or they're trying to defend something that no longer exists. And so, you know, this configuration of the Jews in this social psychological profile as four different roles at the same time is there. And it's historically grounded. So I want to kind of just get a bit through the history, okay? This is complicated because there's an amazing history there. There's an amazing history there, okay? But why the Jews? So you have to understand that they emerge in a crucial moment in a crucial place. Right? They emerge at the beginning of what we call modern civilization as a group. And they are, more, they are monotheistic from the beginning. Right? In other words, they have an innovation that is incredibly important, a single God with whom they have a covenant. And because they have a covenant, they can constantly no negotiate with God rules and habits and social norms, which they do. The innovation of monotheism is crucial, okay? Because you have a context where, where people have a different relationship to nature, where they have many different gods. All of these are inexplicable forces of nature. So they have to be kind of appeased. But, but when the Jews invent the idea of a single god, they give themselves a whole different thinking of, as a group. They give themselves a different governance structure. And they become a state a religion-based state, and it's actually, as far as I know, the first religion-based state. This comes out of the Exodus, around 1200 BCE. So this is about 3,250 uh, 3, years ago. Then they have this history for about 1,200 years, okay, where they have this state, and, and you have to understand that they're in an incredibly important logical sp uh, ge ge geographic space that the southern tip of the Fertile Crescent, where you get the first settlements in human civilization, invention of agriculture, the invention of trade. This is a crescent that goes from a lot in Israel all the way up, all the way to the Persian Gulf, right? Through Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, all the way down Kuwait and, and, and Persia, Iran, okay? And this is, the, this is where the, the, the first cities emerged, right? The story of the Jews starts with Abraham moving from a very crowded place that was already a very well-developed society called Sumer, and his second biggest city, which is Ur. He went from there to Canaan, on the other side of that crescent, with this idea of the covenant, okay? And that place is also tricky because it is a, a route, a natural route because of sea and the rivers with Egypt which is another emerging power. So they have this history, OK, for 1,200 years of a state that gets smashed recurrently. Egyptians, then the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, and finally Rome. And the story of Rome we know pretty well. But they get dispersed in 70 BC. BC means AD, after, after Christ. And then they, up, they end up in a diaspora, spread. And I mean, but, but, you know, what, what is there to, what's interesting there to learn, OK? One of the things that's interesting to learn in the diaspora is how they change their religious operation, state operation, governance operation, into a decentralized system from, from priest class, which was as an enforcer and, and, and the rule developer group, which was the old state, 
up to the Second Temple's destruction, into a very decentralized system of like network externalities with, built around rabbis and their temples in local communities. Where I grew up, this was a synagogue. Our group was a synagogue against other synagogues. There were like maybe 10,000 Jews left okay, in Vienna after World War II from 230,000. And most of the Jews that came in were not Austrian. There was also there were the Austrian synagogues, the Romanian synagogues, the Hungarian synagogues. There were two Hungarian synagogues. I was in one with my father. But you had a, a rabbi. You had, you had a, a system of judges. My father was one of them. Conflict resolution. You had a money system where people, were, when, they were, when people were in trouble, they would go and get money from richer people. You had a school. They spoke many different kinds of dialects and languages, but they all spoke Yiddish in a particular way, which was different from Polish Yiddish. You know, which gets me to the whole other point about language, right? I mean, oh, but let me let me let me stay with my topics. Okay, I'll get to that in a minute, right? Uh, so you have to understand that there's this history, and that within that history of the diaspora, the Jews organized to survive. I mean, they settled in ports. The important thing is they're they in ports. They're in Odessa, they're in Alexandria, they're in Thess Thessaloniki, and they could move. But because they were entrenched in ports and often assigned by local rulers to be the moneylenders, they had already particular positions. And particular positions also that encouraged them to trade. They, they, because they were everywhere, and they were spread everywhere by being pushed out of places that they became too well entrenched, they had network externalities. They had like a network. And one thing that's important about that I have lived through myself, but I also understand as part of what makes this governance system of the Jewish state early on so interesting, right? They were, they were a group, and they still are a group, that argues about everything. They argue. They're taught to argue. When you're in Hader, you argue. And the argument is about rules and laws and histories, and matching the histories with interpretations of laws, and you know, justifying laws on the basis of histories. They have 21 parties in a, in a parliament of 120 people. OK? They argue. But at the same time, they're completely, even if they hate each other's guts, they're completely a group when it, when it counts, OK? They, they, I don't know how to pre express this, but I, I, I was, there was lots of violence committed when I was young on my body, and I got always solace there. I was never afraid. Even if I had incredible conflicts with other Jewish kids, I was never afraid. I was terrified in front of non-Jewish kids for a long time because I was abused. I was beaten up. They were looking at my penis and making fun of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That happened to me. That's why I say it's a very personal history. But, so to go on, right, the, the diaspora also, one of the things that they did, which is a conflict with my father, is they had a kind of informal trade school system, okay, where you learn the trades. And you, this trade get from, gets permeated by your fathers, right, and your mothers to some degree too. But it's a very sexist kind of society when you're in, ultra, in an orthodox community, right? Uh, and so when you say no to your dad, which is what, ha what happened to me at 13, he just started a war. He did not want me to be a school kid, OK? He did not want me to go to school. But I had a mother who was much younger than him who stopped going to school when she was 12, because at the beginning of the war, she was 12, and her mother got killed right away. And then she had to run the house. And she used me and my, daughter, my sister to learn from. So she would sit me down and just, what did you learn today? And she, I would go to geography, history, philosophy, English, whatever, right? And I would entertain her. But it wasn't just entertainment. I realized that she really wanted to know. And I began good at explaining things, you know? And she wanted that. And it became like, this went on until she was 85. And I was, you know, I was 64 until she died, OK? But the point is that she, she helped me decide not to go my father's route and become a jeweler like him. You know? 
So I had, early on, I had to choose Jewish tradition or do I become an economist? Right? And uh, when you do that to your father, you're out. You're out. You're out. In, 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 in this incredibly intensely structured orthodox community, right? There is a, there's a normative pressure context that you cannot imagine. Because the only way the group survives if it has this core of totally committed, how should I put it? Priori you know, religion prioritizing people who absolutely don't even want to worry about asking whether that's justified or not. Right? So, you know, <laughs> I mean, of course, I mean, what happened is ultimately because my mother helped me to get away from my father, basically, uh, she also ended up in the US, right? She also she had to sacrifice her marriage in a way, right? But I'm just telling you that because the group survives. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm broken, I've broken with, I'm no, I mean, I'm an atheist. I became an atheist in one minute, and I'll explain it to you how. But I have a lot of respect for, for very intensely religious groups as, as a survival mode, right? They play an important role in society, obviously. So I don't know whether I'm making too much sense to you, but, but what I'm trying to convey to you is, is twofold. There's a, there, there, it, there's a pattern, right? And the pattern is important because we're getting, in, in certain moments, the, the anti-Semitism becomes a vector for, for trouble, OK? And uh, we are in a moment like, like that right now. I'm pretty sure about that. So three things that I learned from this. One is the power of education. I don't know how to express it, you know? I mean, I, I taught my mother. Then I was thrown out of a right-wing school because the trouble that I was causing as being the only Jew in that school was too much for the directors, and they just pushed me out. But this became a scandal, and I was then adopted by a left-wing school where I wasn't the only Jew. My parents were like, great. I was like 13, right? Exactly when I started also deciding to go to school. My mother arranged to go for me to go to that other school, a left-wing school. And the only reason it was a left-wing school having Jews is that it was the only school in Vienna that had Russia, Russian. So all the communist kids were there. Their parents were communist Jews. My mother didn't know that the fr my best friends of the future would be communists. You know, they made a mistake. But so I was, you know, I was, I mean, I had a philosophy teacher and we were reading Marx when I was 16 and I loved it. I had a history and geography teachers and I was like, just like, the way he described places blew my mind. So, the, the, so that, 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 that saved me, right? I realized that what saved me from my conflict with my Jewish community, but that was when I was 13, and that was a moment when my father tried to kill himself, and I found him, and I saved his life, and he never really seemed to have forgiven me until the day he died. Right? But what saved me were teachers. I knew that at 15, I wanted to be a teacher, that this was socially useful. I could feel it. But then later on, I got very, 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 very close to seven Arab students. Very different Arab students, you know, two were Ber they're not Arabs, they're Berbers. That's a whole complicated story between Arabs and Berbers in the mountains of Algeria, even Tunisia. Uh, I had students that were, that were Islamic fundamentalists with whom I argued forever, where I realized the deep conflict that the Islamic community is going through and, and how we played a role in it. And we can talk about this, OK? Because part of what we're talking about here in terms of that regional war is precisely what happened in 2001, which is a double civil war within the Muslim community, OK? Between the Sunnis and the Shias and within the Sunnis, between the Salafists and the Sufis. And we, we, we walked into it without having a clue. And we made a, 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 a Sufi Sunni state into a into a theocratic Shiite state. 
That was the invasion of Iraq. And now you have this potential that the Israeli conflict with, with Hamas becomes a regional conflict. And then it becomes a, one of those vectors, two vectors, Eastern Europe and Middle East into World War III. It's an entirely plausible scenario, OK? So this is why, actually, what America is going to do about it is pretty important, OK? It's very important. And so in a way, I'm also pleading with young people here. And then I'm going to be finishing this, right? Because I was born in an incredibly happy period of life, historically, right after the war. And I'm going to die before the World War III. That's how I look at it, in my, fear, in my fearful sense, you know, that things, once they go bad, can really go back very fast. And I can see it happen. But, but a lot of this has to do with thinking and, and, and talking and discussing and learning and not killing each other, OK? That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gutman. It's really hard to talk after that. Um, you know, I will say that part of how this event sort of came together was that Professor Gutman had emailed me, um, and a few of other of our, other of us uh, colleagues were on it, the email that his parents are buried in Austria. Oh my God, my sister and my father. Your sister and your father are buried in um, a cemetery in Austria, and it was one of the cemeteries that had been vandalized right after October 7th, and Professor Gutman had expressed his anguish um, over this. And so we decided, you know, we needed to sort of tell his story and talk a little bit about, you know, what, what does anti-Semitism look like in Europe? What does it mean? Um, if you give me one second, because the my screen went off, because I'd like to just do a short power PowerPoint. So what I would like to do is try to leave us with uh, a little bit of thinking about policy to address anti-Semitism, as I am a political scientist. Um, and I'd like to leave enough time for questions, um, because I think you're going to have, a, hopefully, a lot of questions. And you should ask questions when this is over with. Um, so I, I want to give a little backdrop to the European Union's policy to combat anti-Semitism. And it takes us back, I'm going to kind of start with 2015. And in 2015, the European Union created the Coordinator's Office to Combat Anti-Semitism. That is the name of the office. It is lodged within the European Commission, which is the executive body of the European Union. Why was it created in 2015? The reason why it was created in 2015 is that in 2015, we have two very violent anti-Semitic attacks in Europe. One of them was the attack at a kosher supermarket following the attack at Charlie Hebdo, which it was a... Um, um, it, 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 it was a, a newspaper, but they would do a lot of sort of commentary and so on. Um, and the perpetrator went from the, um, the newspaper to specifically targeting a kosher supermarket. And in that kosher supermarket, four people were killed. And then a month later, there was, attack in, there was an attack in Copenhagen, Denmark, where two people were killed. One was right outside of a synagogue during a bat mitzvah. And these two events, because they were so violent and because they happened one month apart from each other, it really captured the attention of the European Union. Here it had happened in two member states. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that there had been other violent attacks against the Jewish community in Europe, and, and just one that comes to mind, there's many others, but was the attack in Toulouse where a rabbi and three children were murdered in the streets of Toulouse, France. And when the French media was trying to figure out, you know, why did this happen and how did this happen, anti-Semitism was not used at all as an explanation for why this attack would have happened. 
it was more about, well, it's extremism and the French haven't um, in, incorporated individuals that are uh, children of immigrants or immigrants into the French community, and that explains why this violent attack happened. And this happened a few times of violent attacks against Jews without European member states or the European Union registering that this is anti-Semitism. But in 2015, it becomes really apparent that there's something going on here. And so at the time, Franz Timmermans uh, was the head of the commission, one of the offices in the commission that deals with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And he held a, um, a conference both on Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And I should say that when the Coordinator's Office for Anti-Semitism was created, there is also a Coordinator's Office for anti-Muslim hate. That's how the Europeans phrase it. They don't necessarily use the word Islamophobia. Um, they use the word uh, anti-Muslim hate. And so there is also a Coordinator's Office to deal with that as well. So that was in 2015. In 2016 is the creation of, and there's a little history to this because it's really not created in 2016, but this definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Definition of Anti-Semitism, which for short is called IRA, was officially adopted in 2016 um, by the International uh, Holocaust Remembrance uh, Association. So the European Union, between 2016 and then throughout 2017, various institutions of the European Union begin to adopt this definition. The European Commission adopts this, the European Parliament, which has a co-legislative function within the European Union, the Council of the European Union adopts it. And the reason why that's important, the Council of the European Union represents the member states of the European Union. And the IRA definition, and I have it on the slideshow, um, is that anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. 45 countries have adopted the IRA definition. Um, 25 member states have adopted the IRA definition. There are 27 members of the European Union. Why this definition? Why is the definition important? The reason why this definition is helpful from a policy perspective is that if you're going to create a policy around anti-Semitism or any concept, you have to define it. You have to know what it is and how it manifests itself. And what is interesting about this definition, and I want to highlight, it is non-legally binding. And you should be aware of that. It is not legally binding. These are suggestions. Um, and so I gave you the, the formal definition. And then the formal definition is followed by several examples. And I'm not going to read all of these. And you can go, I, I have two slides of this. this is, you're never supposed to do this when you teach. Just put a lot of stuff on a slide. But I want to be transparent so that you can see this is what is in the definition. So as I'm talking, you can read this. And I have another slide that I want to pull up. So the definition. Um, where it comes from, the history of it, is it actually emerges in 2004, and it was originally a version of it was created by the European Union uh, Monitoring Committee that I talked about earlier, that Committee on Racism and Xenophobia that is today called the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union. In 2004, the EUMC tries to come up with a definition of anti-Semitism. And this is coming off of, remember I said 2003 was that study that the EUMC did, saw anti-Semitism was on the rise, and they realized, you know, we really got to nail down what does anti-Semitism mean? How do we understand it? And so they came up with a definition. And one of the big questions that they were challenged with was the question of Israel anti-Zionism 
and anti-Semitism. How are these ideas related? Because somehow they're related, but maybe they're not. How do we understand it? And the original position of the 2004 definition was that an act would only be considered anti-Semitic if anti-Israel or anti-Zionist attitudes and expressions where Israel is seen as a representative of the Jew, and what I mean by that, as a representative of the traits attributed to the anti-Semitic construction of the Jew. So if that is not the case, then we would have to consider hostilities towards Jews as Israelis as not anti-Semitic because the hostility is not based on the anti-Semitic stereotyping of Jews. That was the original definition in 2004, and i explain why this is important. In 2004, there was a firebombing at a Jewish elementary day school in Montreal, Canada. And there was a note left behind by the perpetrator that the attack was in retaliation for Israel's assassination of a Hamas leader. And there was a realization that the 2004 definition that the EUMC had come up with would not cover that example of anti-Semitism. One of the critiques that emerged of the 2004 definition came from Kenneth Stern, who is a um, very well-known attorney, someone who's worked on hate crime, and is a director of the Baird Center for the Study of Hate. And he also becomes the head of a revision of the 2004 definition, which is going to come out in 2005. But before I get to that, he argues that the problem, you know, if you think about this, he said, if a Jew, so this is uh, Kenneth Stern, if a Jew is attacked on the streets of Paris because the attacker perceives Israelis as conspiratorial, greedy, slimy, and views French Jews as stand-ins for Israelis, it's anti-Semitism. If that same French Jew is assaulted because the attacker is angry about the Israeli government and attacks the Jew as a proxy for Israel, that's not anti-Semitism under the 2004 definition that the EUMC had come up with. There's a problem with the definition. So in a little bit later in 2004, there is... Um, an, an organization, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, it's an organization. There are many more member states. There's 55 members, so it's not just Europe. It's beyond the European Union. There are members of non-governmental organizations that are brought together. There are 800 participants in all that meet in Berlin to discuss this very issue about anti-Semitism, what's going on in Israel, and how do we understand and define anti-Semitism. And out of this meeting of the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, is something called the Berlin Declaration. And the Berlin Declaration acknowledges that anti-Semitism is directed at Jewry as a collective body. And that hostility towards Israel have targeted Israel as a collective Jew. And it helps, so, so the, the importance of this declaration is it helps the understanding of the link between anti Semitism and anti Israelism. So in 2005, a group of scholars come together using the Berlin Declaration, the 2004 EUMC definition of anti-Semitism, come together to try to create a better definition that would include this idea of what happens when Israel becomes sort of the collective Jew, if you will. What's in this definition, the newer definition, and what is reflected here, and I'll explain how this becomes the final definition, the important thing, I'm switching to my next slide, because that has the piece about Israel on it. I put them with different bullets so you can kind of see where they are. The 2005 definition of anti-Semitism is not about, it, it focuses on intent, not motive. The important thing to think about is intent. 
In other words, would someone thought about Jews or why they have those thoughts, that's question about motive, are not the determining factor. That someone made a specific decision to target Jews because they were Jews is important. That's the intent. So the issue here and what is in this definition is that targeting European Jews for the actions of the state of Israel does not make any sense. You're equating Israel as a collective Jew. That is anti-Semitism. It's not political speech to firebomb a synagogue. If you want to make political speech, you go to the Israeli embassy, and I would never advocate violence. You go to the Israeli embassy. You don't go to a local synagogue. It doesn't make any sense. That's anti-Semitism. And that's why it's in this definition. In 2014, there's a firebombing of a synagogue in Wuppertal, Germany. And the perpetrators were um, Palestinian-born German residents. And they wanted to call attention to the Gaza conflict. October 7th is nothing new. And um, the crime was, uh, the way that it was tried in court was that it was arson. It was a, a criminal act. It was arson, but it was not anti-Semitism. And the court found that it was political speech, it was a protest against Israel, and therefore would not go under the higher penalty that would be under a hate crime. And it's these kinds of events that the IRA definition, and I'll explain how the 2005 definition becomes the IRA definition. This is why the IRA definition was adopted, because it addressed the legal loophole that existed of understanding what is anti-Semitism and holding Jews as a collective in sort of place of Israel. The IRA definition, which is adopted in 2016, is the 2005 definition. In 2005, this group of scholars that were experts, not just on anti-Semitism, but also security of Jews in Europe, and I had the opportunity to interview one of them that was involved in that creation of this definition. And um, you know what? What he had explained to me was, you know, it's very challenging to define anti-Semitism, as Professor Gutman explained. There's a lot of inconsistencies of of how the world views Jews and how anti-Semitism is expressed. And I, I put up here just sort of this is a quickie version of it. Um, you know, the the definition covers what I'm going to call in quotes traditional anti-Semitism. We can break this down in a lot of subgroups, but for the lack of time, I, I just did it this way to be quick. But those, you know, conspiracy theories of Jews controlling capitalism, globalism, um, blaming uh, the Jews for uh, killing uh, deicide, you know, killing God, um, and blood libel, the use of a uh, baby's blood to make matzah for Passover, which is, is all, you know, that is uh, false. Um, secondary anti-Semitism, which I mentioned to you, which is the denial, condoning, or trivialization of the Holocaust, which I would like to note is illegal under European Union law. There is an EU directive that outlaws that, and I can talk more about that because it has significant ramifications for um, how the European Union deals with online content, very different than the United States. And then what is called new anti-Semitism. And this is where the IRA definition um, comes in, and this idea of you know, blaming Jews as a collective for what happens in Israel. I can come back to the self-determination piece um, later during Q&A, because we're, we're running out of time. But I'm happy to come back to that. And you know, I want to be clear that the IRA definition. So in 2005, this definition is created amongst all of these scholars and practitioners. And the EUMC takes that definition and puts it up on their web page and says, look, we have a definition now for anti-Semitism. And then somehow, and I, I have done a lot of reading on this, somehow it disappears off the web page. And I don't know why, how uh, officials have been asked in the EUMC, why'd you take it down? And they never really answer the question, but it's taken down. And in 2016, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance 
adopts this definition more or less the same as the 2005 definition. And that has been, since 2016, a definition that many organizations, many states, even some universities has, have adopted as the definition for anti-Semitism. I know that this is a controversial definition, and we can have a conversation about this, and I hope that you will ask me about it. One of the things that um, Kenneth Stern has brought up, and he, you know, he created, he helped create this definition, is that one of the critiques of it is that it doesn't allow people to criticize the state of Israel because of the way the definition is set up. And if I can just go back one page here. Um, it specifically states that you can't treat Israel different than any other democracy. And in any other democracy, we will critique their politics. And those politics are being critiqued in Israel today, and they're being critiqued here. That is not anti-Semitism. So you can critique Israel's politics it's not anti-Semitism. And the definition doesn't say that that's anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, there are people that have applied this definition incorrectly. So it's not that the definition is a bad, de I would argue, it's not that the definition is a bad definition. It's that it has not always been applied properly. And that happens a lot in, in law. There are times when our US Constitution has not been applied properly. And I would say that is the case also with this definition. So the definition is so important to creating a policy. That's my whole point of talking about the IRA definition. It has shaped the way in which Europe has been able to create a policy to address the threat to the Jewish community, the threat to the European Union, and the threat to European democracy. In 2017, the European Parliament passes a resolution on combating anti-Semitism and basically tells the European Commission we want you to come up with a strategy. 2018, the Council of the European Union declares a fight against anti-Semitism. Again, the Council of the EU represents the member states of the European Union. So member states unanimously decided we need to deal with anti-Semitism. In 2020, and this is under the German presidency at the time, the Council of the EU makes a declaration that we're going to mainstream the fight against anti-Semitism across all EU policy areas. What does that mean? Mainstreaming means you take a, a policy concept, and they did this, the initial one was actually through gender, and to say, you know, we need to look at gender through foreign policy, through labor issues, through, um, you know, equal employment, all kinds of things. And so when we think about anti-Semitism, it goes into foreign policy. And one of the ways that it sort of emerged is regarding funding of UNRWA, which I think you all are aware is the UN um, funding. It, they fund a lot of development and projects in the Palestinian territories. And at a certain point, the, um, there was a third party that did research on this. There were textbooks that were being published with UNRWA money and um, and UNRWA does a lot of the education in the Palestinian territories, and these textbooks had explicit anti-Semitic content. And I would really recommend, like, go online and look at this report. It was by Impact Say. Um, and, you know, they show the pages of the textbook, and they translate them. Um, this was, this was um, done by uh, a third party. This consultation done by a third party showed to the European Union. And the European Parliament held up money to UNRWA in 2020, and they had done it previously because the EU can't be funding, right? If anti-Semitism is a concept that they're going to, uh, you know, think is important, you can't be funding anti-Semitic content in textbooks. And so there was an attempt actually to hold up the funding. UNRWA was supposed to address this, the anti-Semitic content in the textbooks, and it never happened. But that's what I mean by you know mainstreaming is to look at different policy areas and where anti-Semitism can be incorporated into different kinds of policy areas, and then sort of the big thing is 2021. The European Commission comes out with a strategy to combat anti-Semitism and foster Jewish life. 
And what's important about that um, strategy is it does have actionable items that the European Union can do to address anti-Semitism. And they have done some of them. And it's a newer policy. But the pieces of it are preventing and combating all forms of anti-Semitism. Um, a piece of that has been increasing security at Jewish sites, by the way. Protecting and fostering Jewish life in the European Union. So not just um, thinking about uh, just the Holocaust or memory, but a living, breathing community and trying to help that community. Um, education, research, and Holocaust remembrance is also um, one of the main pillars of that program. So there's significant money for education and so on um, in the European Union to uh, assist. Oops, did it go down? It's still there? Okay, we're good. Okay, good. Um, and so um, the you know these are the three pillars of that strategy. Oh yeah, I will. Yeah, and um, the one thing that I just want to mention before I finish: so the EU strategy to combat anti-Semitism uh, came out October fifth, twenty twenty-one. The United States now has a national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. It looks very similar to the EU one. What's interesting, there's a lot of policy transfer from the European Union to the United States. Katarina von Schnorbein, who is the coordinator for the Combating Anti-Semitism Office, met with U.S. officials. Uh, U.S. officials also met with Felix Klein, who's the anti-Semitism envoy from Germany, met with the anti-Semitism envoy from the Netherlands. So this European policy informs the U.S. policy that we currently have. And by the way, the United States also has adopted the IRA definition as a way to inform our national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. So I wanted to make that little bit of a transatlantic connection for all of you, because I know we're only talking about Europe, but to make a little bit of that connection, because we're dealing with the same issues here in the U.S. as they're dealing with in Europe. So at this point, I would like to open up the floor to questions, and I, I hope that you do question us. Both uh, Professor Gutman and myself are happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'm just going to ask that if you please come up and use the microphone, because this is going to be recorded, and they won't be able to hear your question. So if you have a question, come on up to the microphone. Is this on? Everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, first of all, thank you, both of you, for, uh, for this talk. I think this is enormously helpful, um, especially in the, the climate that we're in right now. Um, I also uh, somewhat, somewhat apologize for the fact that this, this will be a somewhat of a critical question. That's, that's um, good. You're supposed to be critical. Yes. It's OK. Okay. Just be polite. Polite yeah, and course. critical is always good. Um, so my, my question was, uh, I, I forget which slide it was, but on the official definition of anti-Semitism, uh, that one, one, yes. yes the, one, yeah. uh, the second to the bottom. Um, yes. I worry that um, in defining anti-Semitism in part by um, as uh, calling Israel's actions condemnable, um, by way of comparison to Nazi policies, uh, somewhat regardless of the basis of the claim. Um, I worry that this sort of does exactly what this uh, amended definition sought to uh, rectify, which is that it, it treats Israel as the collective Jew. Um, and, and I think that, to some extent, much of political uh, commentary and criticism comes by way of, of euphemistic comparison. Um, I, I wonder, does, does that seem counterproductive to you? Do you think that there could be more work on um, fleshing out that, that kind of uh, con uh, contrary messaging? So I think um, 
I think to your point to say, you know, Israel shouldn't be the collective Jew and, and does this do that. And I don't think that this, the, the one that you're talking about, the point about drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Um, I think the concern in the definition, and I, I did not write the definition, um, is the notion of um, if because oftentimes Israel becomes a collective Jew, and if we use the term Nazi, which is inappropriate, right? I mean, Nazism is something different than what Israeli... I understand their slogans, right, that are thrown, they're impactful, but they're not accurate. Um, and I think that is the problem. It's not accurate. And the other you know, piece of this, from a European perspective, when you talk about Nazism and you sort of lighten it, like, oh, that's, you're being a Nazi, or it's trivialization, right? It's, 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 it's taking the Holocaust and sort of not making it as significant as it was. And so I think that's why it's in the definition, in that it, it does that, right? It's sort of that secondary anti-Semitism. It's not an accurate depiction. Um, we can say that you know there might be human rights violations. We can say certain things. And I know like this is a very tense moment. There's nothing wrong with criticizing specific policies that Israel does. There's nothing wrong with that. I think once you just throw you know, the Nazism in there, as a, you're not being accurate, right? And so I think that is the piece of that definition of why it's in there. So that, I think that would be my commentary. I don't know if you have anything else to add. To, but that would be my commentary to it. I didn't write the definition, but that would kind of. But I think you know, to your comment, it's a reasonable comment of, well, doesn't that you know, don't make it the collective Jew, which I think they don't want to do that, but that's sort of what is happening. And thus, if you say, oh, it's Nazism, then you're going to blame Jews in Europe for what Israel is doing. So I think that's sort of the rationale behind it. I, I completely agree with you. I think um, certainly the, the uh, restrictive definition, um, when you uh, compare the actions and say something like, oh, what the Jews did was, it, what, what the Jews are doing or what Israel is doing is like Nazism, that absolutely should not be allowed. Yeah. I th what I worry about, though, is a more expansive definition where um, simply drawing comparisons of actions of Israel to um, actions uh, that the Nazis may have taken um, or, or did did take. I worry that this definition could um, preclude somebody from being able to draw that comparison. Yeah, and I think you know one of the criticism of this definition is does it limit freedom of speech? And I think for a European audience, I mean, pardon me, for an American audience. The answer is yes. For a European audience, it's kind of, mm -hmm. there are limitations to speech. That's one of them. So it, it, it's a little bit different of sort of how we understand, right, freedom of speech in Europe and in the United States. So, and that, by the way, that is one of the, I mean, you, that, that's one of the criticisms that is made of the definition, absolutely. Thank you for your response. Thank you. So I was just wondering, this is a very like controversial thing right now. So I was wondering, what exactly would you say we should come away from this presentation with? Is it like an information session, or like a bringing things to people's attention? What should we come away with? I think you should question. I think that, you know, I've given you some information. Professor Gutman, I'll let Professor Gutman speak for himself. He's very capable, um, but I, you know, I think I would like you to come away um, with thinking. I hope this makes you think, and I think you should be critical, right? I, I, this is not this is what it is, right? I'm giving you a perspective, um, some background, some historical background to understand um, what has happened in Europe, what is currently going on in Europe. 
um, to understand sort of this moment. And I, and I think, um, you know, Professor Gutman is trying to emphasize, like, this moment, there is something going on here, um, and we should be concerned about it, um, not just the Jewish community, but for the sake of democracy, for the sake of other kinds of racism and hate, because this is where it starts. Um, so I would say this is a moment to, to wake up, to notice, to be critical, and to be thoughtful. So I think that would be my, my response. And Professor Gutman, do you have a? What do you want to have come away from here? Hopefully like a new perspective or new information about something that's often either misused or overused, maybe underused. Because we hear a lot of terms thrown yes. around and we don't necessarily always use them right. And their definitions are stretched and sometimes, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, I, I was trying to kind of emphasize that there, were, there, are, there is a history that is really important to understand and, and that it comes in, in a kind of dynamic of cycles. And part of that cycle is also that when you have conflicts that you don't resolve, you will get uh, wars. And they can happen hundreds of years later, right? So, so when I was making that reference to having to make a choice between coexisting or killing each other, that choice is recurrent, it's everywhere, and it comes together in a kind of configuration where, where, where conflict takes over, and it takes over globally, right? And I, I, I was trying to say that I feel we are, in this, we, are, we are in a moment, and part of the moment is, is how we as Americans react to it. And uh, I mean, we have influence both in terms of stopping one war, which is in Ukraine and Russia, but perhaps even more dramatically so, we have lots of influence in how we can also deal with the Middle East and, 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 and Israel, as well as Hamas. So right? the only solution is a two-state solution. And, and if not, then you're going to have just escalation of war. And we are in a critical moment where the escalation could be very, very dangerous, even for Israel itself because it could get into a, a, glo a regional war with Iran and Hezbollah and all that relatively fast, right? So uh, you are part of this. You're going to have to make an election choice, right? <laughs> because you have dramatically different, uh, uh, how should I put it, candidates in terms of Amer America's role in the world, America's relationship to Jews, America's relationship to Israel. These are dramatically different choices between Biden and Trump. And if you want to talk more about that, I'm perfectly willing to. But this is a crucial moment, and you're going to have to make choices as a country. All right. Thank you. Thank you. William? Uh, yeah. Well, hello. Um, again, thank you for the talk. Uh, now, I know you didn't make this definition, either of you, but um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you possibly agree with me that the second and third points are almost contradictory in giving the state of Israel additional protections that other states are not afforded, i.e. claiming the state of Israel is a racist endeavor is not allowed, or anti-Semitism, does that mean that also saying that Catalans not having their own state is anti-Catalanism, or saying that America is, it is impossible to call America a racist organization because that's anti-American? So, yeah, uh, that's a great question. So one of the things that has happened um, and you know, I, I kind of glossed over it, but in 2001, the UN has a uh, a big event about racism, and basically, the the event falls apart because there is a document circulated that um, Israel is a racist endeavor, and if you you know your Catalan example. I would, you know, one would not say that Catalan independence is a racist endeavor. Maybe a Catalan endeavor, right? right. Um, and if you think of any state, like for example, the creation of a Palestinian state, and, and back to Professor Gutman's comment of there should be a two-state solution. There should be a Palestinian state, my, my opinion here, there should be a Palestinian state and there should be an Israeli state. And they should live peacefully. That is my hope, okay? I would never say, or I don't think one should say, let's take, keep it out of the eye, one should not say that to have a Palestinian state would be a racist endeavor. Sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Yeah. So, you know, or 
is Armenia a racist, a racist endeavor because they wanted a state for the Armenian people and Armenian Orthodox peoples? No. It could be nationalistic. It could be, you know, you can use other terms, but to say a racist endeavor, the moment you say that, what comes to mind? It's bad. It's yeah. evil, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you think about most states, right, most states have a nationalistic, I think all states have a nationalistic goal in mind. Mm -hmm. All nationalistic movements have that. So to call one racist and all the rest aren't mm -hmm. is bizarre, right? It's, it, it's not accurate. It's bizarre, but is it? It's a double. It's a double standard, and then it becomes anti-Semitic because if you are a Zionist, if you believe in the state of Israel, then you must be a racist, and therefore you can do the whole, the collective Jew, right? Mm. So that's where the problem. That's where the anti-Semitism comes in. I see. That's the challenge. Well, thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, I am a 1964 graduate of Hofstra. Welcome. Um, my question is, proportionately, how many people in Israel are Jewish? How many people would be considered Christian? How many people would be Muslim or Arab of some group? And um, how many of the Jewish people in Israel came out of Arab countries when Israel was formed? And how many came out of Europe? Do, do you know the I don't know the percentages. Well, Just talking to the microphone. <clears throat> right. So, uh, I mean, currently, this is a complicated question, right? Because if you, you have to wonder whether you include the occupied territories or not, right? And when, well, I'm not sure what you mean by occupied. Well, the occupied territories would be West Bank and Gaza, right? Which currently are under, under uh, I mean, they're, they're not independent states, but they're not part of Israel, but they're, they're certainly under Israeli control, or at least uh, administrative uh, you know, restrictions. And part of the question why it's problem, I mean, within Israel, you have 20% of the Israeli population being Arab. 20% yes. are Arab? Yes. OK. And you, you, when, when, when Israel was founded, this was not the only time that many Sephardic Jews came from Arab countries to Israel. That, that was a process that, that went on for, for you know, maybe 12 years. Why? Because of, uh, I mean, because of, exp I mean, different, different situations in different countries. Tunisia and Morocco are slightly different than Algeria or Iraq. But the, the Jews were, I mean, the Jews were basically expelled from those countries. The Jews were expelled from the Arab countries? Yes, correct. All of them? No, I mean, more or less. I mean, I know for a fact, because I've gone to, Jer to, to Jerba, to a synagogue in Jerba, Tunisia, and I know that there's at least a 1,000 Jews living in Jerba, Tunisia. I also went to Morocco, and I saw Jewish communities there even today. So that's why I said Tunisia and Morocco are somewhat different than, than other countries. But they were expelled from the yes. Arab countries, yes. and where did they go? They went to, well, not all. I mean, many of them actually went also to Paris, right? But... But you have you have uh, three quarters of them going to Israel, from, okay, from, so from three... Morocco all the way to I Iran. So, so that whole fertile crescent <clears throat> that had been populated by Jewish people, yes, no longer has. No, basically, it does not. It has no Jewish people no. in it. They no. all had to go to Israel. Yes. yes, correct. Okay, so would you call all those Arab countries racist? I wouldn't call any country racist. OK. I would call populations racist when they are racist, right? OK. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. 
Okay, we, we are out of time. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon.